slaughter pen. We've crossed Plum Run, uh, one of those many uh, veins that uh, flow into Rock Creek here on the battlefield. And we're going to now turn our attention towards a white fence that you can see out in the field. Now, I don't want to give all of this to you in one sitting, so by the end of the tour, hopefully this will be a well put together mosaic. Uh, but as we continue to talk about hiding places and we talk about the geography uh, and man-made obstacles, let's, let's focus in on that fence. The white fence that is out in no man's land or middle ground between the two armies. Now we're at the base of Devil's Den, just slightly west of Big Round Top. And the way a defensive protocol would uh, go in a battle like this is that after you set up your main line, your defensive line, at the top of Devil's Den, you then throw out your skirmishers and if you have access to sharpshooters, you put them out in the intermediary ground between you and the enemy as a first line of defense. Your enemy does the same thing and so there's a battle within a battle um, out in no man's Skirmishers go out into no man's land prior to the main attack. They have several functions. One of those roles is to report what they see on the ground back to the chain of command to necessary leaders that are back on the main position. For instance, if there are any defiles out in no man's land, low ground, dead spots, where an average sized human would disappear from view, the skirmishers out in no man's land will report that back and it allows an artillerist to pre-cut fuses on artillery to fire artillery shells into an area they can't see where their enemy disappears from them en route to the position they're defending. So it's a way to keep uh, <laughs> all the blind spots covered. A second role of soldiers functioning in the middle ground is to keep obstacles in place if you're defending. If you're General Sickles, and more specifically if you're Hobart Ward defending on this part of the far left of the Union line on the second day of the battle, that white fence out there is important to slowing down the Confederate advance. It can't completely stop it. We all know that. Skirmish line consists of no more than what percentage of your main line anyway? 10%. 10%. So the, the, the skirmishers are not meant to stop a main attack. They're meant to forewarn and to frustrate the advance. If you've ever been in a parking lot and there's speed bumps, and if there's several in a row, you have to slow your car down repeatedly, or you damage the undercarriage of the car. Think of fences as in the Emmitsburg Road on the third day of the battle, Pickett's Charge. Or this white fence out in no man's land between where the Confederates would attack across and the Union defense as a speed bump. Really, Buford's defense is on the first day along with some of Reynolds' early defenses between Belmont Schoolhouse Ridge, Hare Ridge, and McPherson Ridge were nothing more than speed bumps to slow down the Confederate advance on the town. And so that white fence then was to slow the Confederates down. Union sharpshooters would have fought just to keep the fences in place. Meanwhile, Confederate sharpshoot skirmishers would have fought to do what? Take them down in the intervening hour. So that's what the fence is for, at least militarily speaking. The men that positioned themselves along that white fence were Hiram Burdan's sharpshooters, specifically Homer Stoughton's second U.S. sharpshooter. There were Vermont troops directly out in front of us. These were troops from various states. Now, on our front, where we see the white fence, there were Vermonters. But multiple states were either in the second or first U.S. sharpshooters from Maine, Minnesota, and Vermont, uh, Massachusetts, depending on what part of the battle line we're talking about. They wore green coats. Early in the war, they wore blue trousers. By 1863, Many were starting to wear green trousers. They wore calf skin uh, backpack. It was a rustic look to them, uh, not unlike a 
a Jaeger outfit. They look perhaps like they belong somewhere in Europe, maybe the Alps. Though they had this rustic, distinct look about them. And the green was to distinguish them from the average soldier wearing a dark blue wool coat and light blue wool trousers. The distinction was they were the best marksmen around. Now let's say something about sharpshooters as you get to know these people under Hiram Burdan and Homer Stoughton. They had a different mindset than did this average soldier in the ranks. Most soldiers were trained to fight side by side. They would fire behind a wall of smoke. This is still the era before smokeless gunpowder. Behind a wall of smoke, you fire in groups. You're not sure whether you hit someone or not. You keep firing in the direction where you last saw your enemy. Not so with sharpshooters. They separated enough that the smoke would clear so they could take deliberate aim. And like a hunter in a tree stand, they would spend hours out there waiting for the moment to shoot at who? Officers. And to shoot it once the main column started to attack, to shoot at the flags and at people who were in the know or who were directing the attack. If you read the press in 1862-63, there was still a lot of people in this country unsure about the gentleman aspects of fighting like this. That you could shoot someone <laughs> while they were leaving themselves behind the line or filling their canteen. Um, Normally in a, a duel, you allow your opponent to pick his weapon and you allow him to have there's a certain fairness. And then you and I think, well, uh, if the end game is death, what does it really matter? It was a code of honor that guided them. In those days, there was a very real heaven and a very real hell. And your conduct on this earth could have a carryover effect. You know how upset some of us will become at a ball game when the game is not called fairly. War was conducted with those same codes of rules and behavior. There was a certain respectability that had to be maintained. But those men had the ability, those sharpshooters, they qualified in hitting with an 10 inch diameter of a bullseye at 100 yards standing or lying down 200 yards away within 10 inch diameter of a bullseye. They had to not only pick someone off that might be unarmed, but they had to be able to sleep at night. So it took a unique personality. They tended to be loners. So those men out there were painting a proper picture for you were wearing green coats. And the first Confederates that they encountered were skirmishers out in front of Walls Alabamians, and eventually intermingling would have been Robertson's Texans and Arkansas troops. Once the Confederates started attacking sometime after 4 p.m. on July 2nd, a, a wall of smoke would have covered the white fence as Verdan's men took aim. By the way, Verdan's men recorded seeing Confederates falling that they weren't shooting at. What was going on there? Some of them that weren't even there in their uh, crosshair. They just fell. Yeah, heat. Uh, Laws Alabamians who attacked the Devil's Den Little Round Top area, primarily Little Round Top, marched 24 <laughs> miles in one day to get here. So uh, there was exhaustion, and we know too, it's well documented that there was uneven distributions of water in the regiments, so some of them were subject to heat strokes and exhaustion. So I want you to see that fence then, not as a <coughs> stopping point, a main defensive line, but I want you to see it as a speed bump that warns the main line to get ready. And the line of fire by Verdan's men channeled Confederates to where the main line was waiting for them sometime in, in crossfire traps. You'll see that later. Now, changing the subject before we move on, and I see people in the balcony up there. <laughs> uh, before we move on, let's lighten things up just a little bit and mention that we're on a trolley bed. We're going to be walking on a hard surface. We're already walking on a hard surface. 
that in the middle 1880s, an electric trolley was run through here from downtown to here. William Tipton, the famous photographer, had a studio on the east side of Big Round Top. He helped uh, the train come down, the trolley come down here by paying for some dynamiting to clear rocks to put in this hard bed for tracks. And in the middle 1880s, this is before, long before the Model T production of 1915. This is long before you would see automobiles. Prior to the trolley on the field, you had to cross the field on foot or in what? Wagons. Wagons. For people living in the middle 1880s, it was state of the art to buy a ticket and to get on the trolley and had bells and whistles. <laughs> Try to imagine people of that Victorian era with their prim and proper dress coming through where we're standing, woo, woo, and going past us, you know, occasionally you would hear a ding, 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 ding and they would look out across and be told some of the same stories that I'm relaying to you. Now eventually the trolley was deemed too commercial and in a landmark setting precedent case in 1896 the Supreme Court of the United States ruled uh, in favor of the veterans that the trolley was too commercial. That's happened, something similar to that has happened here more than once over the years, hasn't it? Uh, that the, you know, the, the balance between commercialism and, and uh, naturalism here on the battlefield. So it was condemned, was the trolley, and parts of the battlefield that are now incorporated into Gettysburg National Military Park came into the park boundaries because of that condemnation of the trolley. And then the tra tracks were ripped out much later. But you're now walking in an old trolley bed. If you want to mix it up a little bit, uh, think about sitting uh, on that trolley. If you go on online and type in um, Gettysburg trolley, there's some old postcards out there showing that quaint trolley that came through. One last point. Look behind you, for most of us, you'll see that as a portion of us standing up on the bank, that's another lurking place or a hiding place that General Hunt told us about. Can you see how a sharpshooter could gain cover here against Devil's Den? Keep that in mind later when you're at the top of Devil's Den. Now I'm going to move ahead of you out to the trolley track and, and uh, we'll see you at the base of where the first Texas made their attack at the next stop. We're watching at home, um, online or on TV, we're now standing at the very bottom of Devil's Den. We're getting ready to ascend it. We're going to follow the 1st Texas Infantry. And we'll also mention the 3rd Arkansas. We'll bring in some Georgians and balance it with the Union defense when we get to the top of the hill. We're moving now from the hiding and lurking places that are specially destructive, according to Henry Hunt. And we're now shifting more toward um, our two greatest fears, death and not having matter. We're going to begin to meet people that fought in this area on July 2nd, 1863. Uh, the 1st Texas was part of Jerome Robertson's brigade. They would step off for their attack on July 2nd, 1863, sometime around 4 p.m. and descend down into a valley. The Emmitsburg Road is very high and well built up and they were guiding on the Emmitsburg Road, but when they stepped off the Emmitsburg Road, the road drops off on its easterly slope, not unlike a swimming pool drops off for a skateboarder. And so it directed Confederates down into the basin. That along with centrifugal force, if you ever ridden a bicycle and you come to a curve and you want to turn left, you want to dog leg left, what does the bicycle want to do? It wants to go straight, which would take it further to the right than you want it to go. Because of centrifugal force and because of the not uh, natural decline of the Emmitsburg Road Ridge, almost like a bathtub depression. The Confederates started drifting in their attack, did the Texans and the Alabamians, far away from the Emmitsburg Road. And the hiding places and lurking places that we've looked at and others that we haven't seen, some of those you'll see this afternoon with Matt, broke up the attack <coughs> further and just kept atomizing the attack, which put the first Texas down here uh, on an island. Now the Arkansas troops were beside them. 
But the rest of the Texas Brigade drifted towards Little Round Top, well to your right, well uh, east of here, and that'll they'll be the subject of the latter part of the tour. When the first Texas got here under Colonel Philip Work, they had a reputation. You may know that they suffered heavily at the hands of Union troops in Miller's Cornfield, September 17, 1862, at the Battle of Antietam. Uh, they lost 186 men out of 236 men. That's 82.3% losses. That's higher than the 26 North Carolina suffered on the first day of Gettysburg. It's the highest percentage loss of a Confederate regiment during the Civil War. From that point on, they were nicknamed the Ragged First. Uh, and they likely lost Lewis Wigfall's dress to, uh, in the fight at Miller's Cornfield. It was left and then recovered by Union soldiers. Specifically, that was a flag reportedly made from the dress of Lewis Wigfall's wife. You know, he would be a U.S. Senator and a Confederate Senator and had a heavy hand in forming the first Texas. But there would have been other Texas flags that day in their ranks. When they descended down into this bottom where we are, they would have tried to find hiding places and lurking places. We'll try to get a couple of camera shots of those places on the way up that would conceal bodies of troops as they advanced towards the 124th New York. On our left and tied to them would have been the 3rd Arkansas going up through Rose Woods. And occasionally people ask, are the woods today like they were back then? Generally speaking, I should say first off, the park service through its general management plan and through its contract Pennington, contractor Pennington. A lot of the woods have been removed that were here over the last century. And so the park is very proud that portions of the battlefield are better restored than they have for a hundred years. Even so, people in those days, the 1860s, were highly dependent on wood as an energy source. For firewood, for cooking, for building fences, barns, houses, and so wood was constantly in demand, which meant that unlike what we try to do, which is to come in periodically and remove trees, 1860s families needed, if there were roughly 140 families in the area and they all needed multiple cords of wood to keep warm in the winter, that means there was a constant erosion of the woods around here. This rose woods would have had stands of timber, but hogs would have eaten out and cattle would have eaten out the lower vegetation, so the floor would have been clean and there would have been lines of sight all the way up to blue uniforms at the top of the hill mainly the 20th Indiana under Colonel Wheeler and the 86th New York. They were part of Hobart Ward's brigade. So in turn, those Union defenders could look down and see gray and butternut uniforms picking their way between the timber. One other clarification if you're trying to picture all of this, the stands of trees that Pennington left and that the Park Service authorized to be left are in the same place, but they're considerably taller than they were then. Most of them were a third to half that height. And there would have been clearer lines of sight between all of them, cattle having eaten the underbrush. The third Arkansas, according to J.B. Polly and his history of Hood's Texas Brigade, will do to tie to, said members of the first Texas. And that's a, that's a high compliment from a Texan. Do we have any Texans here in the crowd? Okay. If you say that a regiment will do to tie to, that's a high compliment. It means you'll stand with them in a fight. They carried with them a silk flag that was blue that said Monticello or Monticello on it. Uh, and another distinguishing feature of the 3rd Arkansas that went up through Rose Woods that day to fight New Yorkers and Indiana troops at the top was they carried Arkansas toothpicks. They were, these were blades that they carried that curved. And those of you interested in Southern history, you know Southerners in the back country are known for scratching, biting, plucking out eyes. Uh, and uh, before duels became sophisticated in the early 1800s through chosen pistols mostly, and go back to the 1700s back country, 
an Arkansas toothpick represents a way you maintained your honor and, and an ugly brawl with someone else. So this would have been a badge of honor to the third Arkansas as they ascended uh, Rose Wood. Now we're going to step out into the open. This is the part where we can't be protected from shade. We're going to walk up through an area known as Triangle Field. And I'll say this as a transition before we do so. When the trolley ran through here in the mid in 1880s and beyond to the early 1890s, one of the favorite sayings on that trolley tour was that you were passing the Triangle Field. There were at least two stone walls and there's some debate about a third and when it was put in place. But the three stone walls in place by the mid-1880s, from an aerial perspective, look like a triangle. Humans have always been fascinated with triangles, haven't we? They're, they're mysterious. The Bermuda Triangle, right? Uh, the pyramids at Giza are four-sided triangles. And triangles have a mystical quality to us. Our pyramids are, that is, hierarchical pyramids. Maslow's hierarchy theory. Er, we use um, triangles. So we're walking up through uh, a triangle field, and there were stories about how photographs would never develop in the field. And uh, I'm not here to criticize anyone that uh, holds those thoughts near and dear. It's just all part of the folk culture here, isn't it? And hopefully this camera will continue to run when we walk up your triangle field. So, all right, we're going to start to ascend the hill. Okay, well. if you're That's watching, we're now at the top minute, of Devil's Den, the top of oh, yeah. He's uh, a piece of ground that came to be known as Triangle Field after the war. And we're along very close to where the 124th New York's line of battle was. And I mentioned to you earlier there's some debate as to whether there was a stone wall to complete the hawk pen here at the top of the hill, whether it was here during the battle or it was a post-war phenomenon. In any case, we're in the vicinity of where the 124th was. Now, Linda Minahan here in the audience had a relative who was in this defense, and his name was? John Vermilia. And I also want to thank, uh, as she mentions her relative, John Vermilia, thank her for greatly influencing my interpretation here. Uh, and we're talking about lurking places, hiding places that are especially difficult, but we've also had this parallel theme that we're now going to immerse ourselves more and more in, and it is humans' two greatest fears, the fear of death and the fear of not having matter. There are several key characters that face a grave circumstance on July 2nd as the Texans and the Arkansas troops ascended into the Triangle Field. Those were Colonels Augustus Van Horn Ellis of the 124th New York, a Major James Cromwell, a Lieutenant Francis Cummings, a Captain Wagant, and these characters would play, play a key role in the defense of Devil's Den that afternoon on July 2nd, 1863. Mainly what Colonel Augustus Van Horn Ellis was most worried about and shared with Cummings and shared with Cromwell was not allowing the Confederates to get too close, but yet not waiting too long to fire upon them. They wanted to find a perfect balance of when they fired their volley. They could see the tide coming toward them. And the camera is able to uh, catch this view. You all can see it. In the distance there, where the grass tends to lighten, there's a distinct tree line. It's way off in the distance, about a mile or so away. That's Warfield Ridge. And it would be from there where the Texas troops and the Alabama troops, supported by Georgia troops, would step out of the woods at a given moment after their artillery had fired at this ridge and this ridge had fired back, Confederate infantry descended down into the valley. We said centrifugal force, we said um, the geography combined to break up the movement, but in any case, the Texans descended down into the valley. They came up through Triangle Field like we have been doing. The New Yorkers, 124th New York. They have a monument, by the way, here in Devil's Den. They have one over on High Watermark, Cemetery Ridge, and another in Goshen, New York. They were known as the Orange Blossom. It's widely believed that 
uh, Stephen Crane's Red Badge of Courage is based on this regiment, the Orange Blossoms, the 124 oh. New York's fight at Chancellorsville. And this uh, famous regiment, the 124, and their colonel, Augustus Van Horn Ellis, had to decide how close he was going to allow these Texans to encroach upon his position. Everything I've set up to this point should help us answer this question. Why not let the Confederates get too close? They might disappear in one of those hiding places. They might disappear into one of those hiding places. So you want to fire before they disappear in a hiding place, a lurking place that is specially difficult. And we've pointed those out and documented those places all along the way. What the Colonel of the 124th could also see, though, was following them at 400 yards, keeping the correct pacing at 400 yards, were support troops under Henry Benning. We're talking about a rather large Georgia brigade of close to 2,000 men. And uh, to our right of them, T. J. Anderson's Georgians. And the Georgians were moving and keeping a 400-yard interval with the Texans and the Alabamians that were out in, in the main attack. And why keep a 400-yard pacing if you're in the support ranks? Why did the Georgians stay at 400 yards? If the Alabamians and the Texans halted on the front line, so did the Georgians to keep the intervals at 400 yards. Why the emphasis on 400 yards? Out of range of small arms fire. Out of range of small arms fire. Shots fired by the New Yorkers and other defenders at the Texans and the Arkansas of the Alabama troops would likely be spent by the time they hit the area where supports are. So 400 yards is a prescribed distance to be out of small arms fire. What's the other reason why 400 yards is maintained for spacing? Fallback. A fallback. If the main attack fails, panic could set in. Panic will dissipate over 400 yards. That had been learned in previous battles. So that the support troops can restore order and not be infected by the panic. That's why spacing is kept. That's why John Reynolds had the 1st Corps not follow the 11th Corps quite so closely. That's why troops on the first day were spaced on Cemetery Hill as they were spaced on McPherson Ridge. Careful spacing is given so if a route occurs to the front ranks, they don't infect panic in the support so that an enemy attacker can't roll one on onto another, back onto another in a domino effect. Are there any other reasons why supports follow at 400 yards? They can maneuver. Officers that are with the supports have a line of sight that's more panoramic. And they can maneuver those reserve troops to where they're most needed, vis-a-vis -vis Armistead on the third day, swerving to the inside rather than going to the outside where artillery was not supporting them. So for all those reasons, and then one, one more reason, support troops are there as a constant reminder to the main attack line that there's nowhere to go. If you're thinking about retreating and you're in the ragged first, the first Texas, and you look back, the supports, bending supports, are following you like a human snowplow pushing you forward. That's All of that is about command and control and about controlling panic. Colonel Augustus Van Horn Ellis and Major Cromwell and Francis Cummings knew that that those waves are coming at them. The Georgians would have disappeared from their view where that stand of trees is. We said it wasn't as formidable at the time, but there were some trees. If you stand on the other side, an average height person disappears from line of sight up on this ridge. So what they decided, did Cromwell and Van Ornelis, was the timing of the attack should be in such a way to hit the Texans, force them back on the Georgians, at the 400 yard interval near the distant wood. And that might stymie the whole advance. But they would have to hit them hard. And that would prevent the supports from coming forward. Maybe the supports would stay at a distance where the main line would fall back on them. And that would stymie the advance of the attack. That's something else important to remember about the 400 yard spacing. For reserves, 400 yards is close enough to the main attack that if the main attack succeeds, 400 yards can be closed pretty quickly to exploit whatever advantages are there to be exploited. <clears throat> Eliminating the Texans and the Arkansas troops early 
might cause the reserves to stall and the whole attack to stall. Uh, so the timing was crucial and it, at one point in the memory of the soldiers of the 124th New York they recalled these officers going over to a tree and untying their horses and as Major Cromwell started to climb on his horse someone asked what are you doing? Are you out of your mind? Oh, what's difficult? What's dangerous about mounting a horse as an officer? You're an easy target. And there were no doubt Confederate squirrel hunters out there that would be looking for, for such a target. But what's the advantage of being on horseback? Mobility. Mobility. You can move back and forth and make corrections and observation. There's an elevated point of view that you have. Uh, and in addition to that, there's a morale factor. And Cromwell revealed it in one of the most famous lines of the battle. It's right up there with Armistead saying, give them cold steel. It's right up there with Custer saying to the first Michigan on the third day at East Cavalry Field, come on ye Wolverines. Cromwell uttered, but not with the same enthusiasm and excite excitement. He grimly uttered what? The men must see us today. The men must see us today. You talk about you talk about our greatest fears, death and the fear of not having mattered. Boy, I get chills just telling that story. <laughs> Think of that moment. We all have moments like that in life, don't we? Choke points where there's no way around. We have to go through it. Uh, if uh, God forbid there were a break in in your house and you have kids or grandkids in the house. You can't let them get to the door first, right? You have to, if you're the, let's say, the, the husband or you're the parent, you, the one, responsible one, you have to go. To, and nothing would stop you from doing it anyway. There are times, said General Hancock, when a corps, corps commander's, commander's life, life is worth count. nothing. It does not count. That's except to be out in front of the men for moral support. Imagine if Van Horn Ellis, the colonel, and Major Cromwell were nowhere to be seen at this critical moment. Do you think they could ever regain the confidence of these troops? And so Cromwell started to move forward. The 124th advanced from the crest of the hill, not from the stone wall that's behind you, but from the crest of the hill. Advanced down into the field and fired at the Texans who fired back. Cromwell came into the midst did the Major Cromwell, who had just uttered these famous words, he tried to rally the troops when he was struck. And according to one account, he fell forward to the mane of his horse. The horse lunged forward and threw his body into the stone wall adjacent to Rose Woods here to my right. So he went head first into the stone wall. And above the rumble of uh, noise and confusion, Augustus Van Horn Ellis saw this moment and he started to yell at New Yorkers that were within his hearing range. He said, your major is down, your major is down. He was urging them to rally. So the New Yorkers, these orange blossoms, rallied again, charged down, and were somewhat successful with the Texans when a worst case scenario occurred for them. The reserves, those Georgians that we mentioned earlier that were behind that closest ridge, poured over like Niagara Falls, just poured over down into the basin, 2,000 strong, and overran parts of the 124th New York. And those Georgians started to rush up to the top of the hill. If the camera could get a shot again over to our left of the ridge I mentioned earlier, notice how you can't see anything on the other side of the ridge if you're standing near where we're standing. That allowed hiding places, lurking places, for Georgians mixed with Alabama troops to circle around and get up behind the position. So the New Yorkers were trying to salvage what they had. Augustus Van Horn Ellis was killed in that melee. So the colonel was down, the major was down. That left, and uh, uh, Francis Cummings was wounded. That left Captain Wagan, who would later write the regimental history for the 124th, he was the captain of Company A in this fight. He looked around, saw the numbers, saw that they couldn't go any further. And so he became concerned about the cannons at the top of the hill that had been supporting the attack. 
and he realized that their responsibility was to take what they had left, rally, and protect the guns. Captain James Smith, who was in charge of six guns, four of them at the <coughs> crest behind you, was overheard by some to say, plead with some to help him save the guns. The Confederates would look upon capturing some of those guns as a badge of honor. Three of them were captured. Another that was damaged was pushed over the edge into those major boulders that we call Devil's Den. The rebels got all around the top of the hill, brought up some of their best marksmen, and began to take aim at a fight that was going on over on Little Round Top. Now let me say that the 124th New York did not fight alone. The 99th Pennsylvania, largely organized in Philadelphia and Lancaster counties, under Colonel John Moore, they came rushing down from near the wheat field to here. As did the 4th Maine under Colonel Elijah Walker. They were shifted somewhat to the left to help the 124th make this stand. And though they gave up the top of this ridge on the second day of the battle, they didn't retreat far. They just fell back into a basin on the reverse slope where the Pennsylvania Reserves would come up and support, and so would the U.S. regulars, and create a closer inner line defense to Little Round Top. But the Confederates would take the summit, and that was considered a significant moment for them, and they would use it as a stronghold to harass officers and signal officers on Little Round Top, the remainder of the battle. And now our next stop is going to be I want to get us back out in the road, and then we're going to start to shift direction uh, towards Little Round Top. We can say safely as we leave here, and I hope you all agree, Major Cromwell met his two fears. The fears that we all shall share head on. The fear of death and the fear of not having mattered. He and the Colonel Van Horn Ellis their bodies were lay and stayed on a rock where their monument is today. Captain Wagan of Company A described looking at them lifeless, seeing the Colonel Van Horn Ellis laying lifeless across the rock, his body having been retrieved and taken to the top of the ridge, seeing spittles of blood mixed with a gold locket around his neck. I'm happy to say that his face, Van Horn Ellis' face, the Colonel of the 124th New York Orange Blossom, his face is embedded in the monument. He's looking out across this field for eternity. Mm -hmm. He mattered, didn't he, that day? Mm -hmm. Okay, he mattered. Okay, I'll see you at the top of the ridge. Uh, let me get out there to direct us. Specifically, what I want us to do is to move over towards a tree to your right. In the 1880s, there were an average of 30 new monuments put on the battlefield per year. And one after another reunion occurred that was punctuated by the dedication of a monument. Usually, wagons would park all around that monument. Men and women would dress in their refinery. Children would run around in the background. Hymns were sung, speeches were given. A lot of that is in, in our national archives now in terms of the speeches that have been saved. That is our park archives. And time capsules were put in some of the monuments. But it was a time when, we call it the memorial period, when soldiers were looking back from their late 30s, early 40s, some of them older, in the 1880s, they were looking back to the prime of their life, back to when they were 18, 19, 21 years of age. Like you going back to a high school reunion 25 years later. And there was a certain magical quality to these reunions. But the final moment, that, that caused the, the crowd to be filled with excitement is when the tarp was pulled off the monument and where families of veterans and veterans could see the monument for the first time in place. Well, at the dedication during the memorial period of this monument here to the 4th New York Independent Battery, Captain James Smith's battery, remember we said James Smith had said during the defense of Devil's Den Triangle Field, don't let them take my guns, men. He called out for support to help save his guns. Uh, and 
Captain Smith, though, was here as part of the festivities to dedicate that monument. And try to picture then a, a wooden platform and some red, white, and blue banners around it and all of the other proppings and trappings that I described. And at some point, he exchanged some words with someone on the platform. And the words were exchanged with Hobart Ward and Henry Hunt. Henry Hunt was uh, chief of artillery. And the, the statement that Hunt made, perhaps in a whispered voice, was, you know, uh, it, to Hunt, Captain Smith said, you know, these guns were not here where we're dedicating them. <laughs> and Hunt said, I know, had they been, you would have been court-martialed. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, uh, Gary Adelman and Tim Smith and others that have been interested on in where those guns were during the fight would just hope that Captain Smith had said something else about exactly where the guns were, but he, but he didn't. Uh, one point that Tom Desjardins made to me a few years ago was, we debate about whether those guns were above the road or below the road, but remember the road wasn't there. And also keep in mind, on the third day of the battle, you recall that Cushing's guns were pushed forward, at least several of them were pushed in the angle down to the stone wall to fire canister. Maybe the answer of whether the guns were at the top of the ridge or closer to Triangle Field, maybe the answer is both. Maybe at long range fire, the guns were at the top of the hill, and perhaps a couple were pushed forward to fire canister to extract the Texans from those lurking and hiding places on the side of the hill that we've documented throughout the tour. In either case, uh, James Smith didn't elaborate. Now, one other note about that monument. Some of you know that tragically, a few years ago, a vandal came through, apparently attached it to some kind of vehicle with a chain and, or a rope and pulled it over and didn't stop there. They decapitated Captain Smith uh, and spray painted it with red. Uh, this is a, a cruel and disrespectful uh, act. But thanks to hard work behind the scenes, our monument restoration crew worked tirelessly to restore the monument, and it was just rededicated a few months ago. So let's give them a round of applause. And now we can safely say Captain James Smith faced his two fears straight head on. The fear of death and not having mattered. And we've made sure that he'll always matter. That his crew, will, his monument will always be respected. And we're going to pick our way down through Devil's Den. If you're watching from home, this is a more trickier aspect of the tour. We have to find sending paths down through the Devil's Den. And we'll meet at the bottom of the hill at the bridge. You all will see the bridge as you start to descend Devil's Den. So let's make our way there now. Okay, if you're watching at home, we're ascending uh, the saddle between Big and Little Round Top. We're straddling the two. Big Round Top would be directly to the south or to your right. Little Round Top to the north or to your left. And we're walking up Warren Avenue. This will be a stop here where I want to try to describe what was going on on the south slope of Little Round Top on July 2nd. Now, as the Confederates suffered from the drop off of the Emmitsburg Road, that not unlike a swimming pool skateboard effect up, forced them to sink down into a basement uh, away from the Emmitsburg Road, coupled with centrifugal force which continued to drift them east away from the Emmitsburg Road towards the Round Tops, uh, added to and in combination with the rough, rocky ground, the lurking places, hiding places that broke up their advance, that animal, uh, atomized and particleized their lines. It, it caused the Texans to split in the middle. And so at our last stop, just west of here in Triangle Field, Devil's Den, we looked at the first Texas fighting with the third Arkansas. And you would think that they should be fighting right alongside the rest of the Texas Brigade, the fourth and fifth Texas. But because of the reasons that I just gave, the two became separated. Now, Evander Law, who is in command of the entire uh, attack on this end of the field once John Bell Hood was wounded, tried to remedy 
the schism in the Texas Brigade line by shifting two regiments, the 44th and 48th Alabama, from its far extreme right into the gorge where we made our first stop, the area that came to be known as Slaughter Pen, to try to put a bathtub plug in the ranks to build a bridge between the separated Arkansas and Texas troops on one side and then Texas troops on the other. Now the 4th and 5th Texas, separated from the 1st Texas, we said would not end up in Triangle Field Devil's Den, but would end up further east where we're standing. They would come out of the big round top woods, for most of you it's behind you, and they would come out to where we're standing and start to assault up the hill that came to be known as Little Round Top. As we talk about the fear of death and not having matter, that was at its highest peak were those emotions during this fight. There were several key Union characters that would have to act and block out those fears and act promptly. One of them was Governor Warren, the Chief Engineer of the Union Army. When he came back to talk about how he patchwork quilted the Union line by putting Union troops on Little Round Top just in time to meet the Texans and the Alabamians, he did so with a certain urgency in his voice. Some of you know that at Five Forks, early April of 1865, he was suddenly removed from command by Phil Sheridan. And after the war, he would fight that, uh, that rendering, that ruling, and through a court of inquiry in 1878, he was completely exonerated. And he would go to his death three years later knowing his name was clean, that he shouldn't have been relieved of command at five forks. That the court of inquiry actually rendered a judgment that Phil Sheridan had acted rashly that day. So he was completely exonerated. But prior to that, he came to some of the early reunions. Governor Warren would stand up on that hill never knowing if he was going to be remembered the correct way. And so with earnestness and passion, he talked about how he put troops into position there at the last minute, how he had an artillery gun ordered to fire from Devil's Den toward where the Confederates were attacking from, which gave him surefire confidence that the Confederates were indeed outflanking Sickles' position, specifically Hobart Ward's position at Devil's Den. Another person that had to face the fear of death and not having mattered was Strong Vincent. You all know Colonel Strong Vincent was the brigade commander that agreed through a liaison, Lieutenant uh, Washington Roebling, to come to the top of this hill in the nick of time, as it turns out, maybe 10 minutes before the Texans and the Alabamians emerged from Big Round Top to attack. That Strong Vincent was the son of an iron foundryman in Waterford, Pennsylvania. Some of you know he went to Trinity College and then graduated from Harvard in 1859. His wife, he married his wife on the first day he enlisted and they made their goodbyes even as he was leaving. She was pregnant with their first child and he had sort of a premonition that he might not make it and so he sent her a letter before this battle that if he died in the next battle there would be no greater cause she should rest assured that he could die for. So he knew that he had a child on the way as he, you talk about the fear of death and not having matter, it weighed pretty heavily, did, didn't it? And again, I, I feel the chills uh, as I talk about it. Vincent put into position on top of the hill from our left to right, eventually the 16th Michigan, the 44th New York, 16th Michigan was from Detroit. They were under Norville Welch. The uh, troops right beside them were called, um, those troops were from the 44th New York, and uh, those troops were from mustered from Albany, and they were under Henry Rice. Rice's name you'll hear again before we're done. He is promoted. Uh, uh, under tragic circumstances on the fight on Little Round Top. The next regiment beside, as you go east and around the southeastern slope of Little Round Top, was the 83rd Pennsylvania, Strong Vincent's old regiment from Erie. There's a Strong Vincent High School there today. That regiment was near and dear to his heart. The next regiment over and the last one eventually in line was the 20th Maine under Joshua Chamberlain. 
And so those 1,300 and some odd troops were rushed into position. Oliver Norton, who was a bugler and a flag bearer that day, was like the little mouse in the room listening to everything. And he would correspond with veterans that survived after the war and compiled a rich resource called Attack and Defense of Little Round Top. It's a standard read if you're interested in the Battle of Gettysburg. But that day, he was scolded by Vincent for exposing the flag to Confederate artillery in the distance. Apparently the Confederates had a line of sight and they started firing at where they saw the flag. Vincent said, get that flag down, Norton. Get the flag out of sight. The 4th and 5th Texas emerged not 10 minutes after Union defenses were thrown together. And the 5th Texas would have been on your right, further to the east. They were shock troops. They were called the Bloody Fifth. Um, some of you are aware they got their name just before the second Manassas campaign, several months before the second Manassas campaign, in the winter of 1861-62, they were across the Potomac River from Herier-Zouaves, the 5th New York, and the two were shouting across the frozen lake, or frozen uh, river at each other. We would say today trash talking, <laughs> giving each other the business. And both vowed that they were going to follow through and they got their chance on sec at 2nd Manassas. The 5th Texas got the better of them, of the 5th New York, in a serious way. And Evander Law noted that they were his bloody 5th. They were shock troops. They had uh, some of your best fighters in either army. Uh, the man that's from Texas probably appreciates this. But uh, let's give them their due. There was the Guadalupe Rangers, the Mustang Grays, Green's Rifles the Lone Star Guards. These are the same troops, the 5th and then we're also getting ready to mention the 4th Texas. They told Lee to the rear at the wilderness. Remember Lee at the wilderness was trying to cover for a uh, hill and for Longstreet to come up and standing in the breach for the Texans and Lee said something to the effect of the Texans always move their enemy. They always go forward and they became so animated and excited they went forward and Lee got excited and went forward with them. It's a famous moment in the war when Lee had to be, in May of 1864, pulled to the rear of the lines by the tech. This is a this is a tough unit. They shouldn't be overlooked. But they're shock troops, meaning they were supposed to break up the line and then supports were supposed to follow through and carry the day. They used the rocks, the lurking places, the hiding places that are a special difficulty, according to General Hunt to pick their way to the top of the hill. And I'll challenge you later today, if you go up on Little Round Top and look down, you will not be able to see the road where we're standing. In fact, people visiting up there now, except the ones that are closest to us, most of the people that are on Little Round Top now do not know we're even here. The ground completely conceals us. And that's an advantage to an attacker. Uh, it's called a dead space today uh, in military warfare. So the Confederates used this precipice dead space to use a blind access to the top. The 16th Michigan was surprised enough that four companies, close to 100 men, retreated. Vincent had picked the perfect place to defend, though. When you're defending a high hill like this, you never want to start the defense at the highest point. And why is that? No Nowhere to, to retreat. Yeah. If you fall back, then you have to attack along the reverse slope to regain what you had. But you don't want to go too far forward of a hill like this to defend it, because then you lose the advantage of the heights. Vincent had found a halfway point, as fate would have it, in the two years leading up to this battle, the western slope of Little Round Top had been felled for trees. Because it was treeless, there were lines of sight for small arms fire and for artillery. Vincent found a shelf exposed where he could have happy ground, neither too low or too high. And so he built in some cushion for those troops to fall back. Meanwhile, Governor Warren was facing up to his fears that day by calling on more reinforcements to come up, mainly Stephen Weed's brigade and in the lead, uh, Patty O'Rourke's 140th New York from Rochester. Patty O'Rourke made eye contact with uh, Governor Warren, who ordered them up here, and he read his expression and he said, don't worry, Patty, if there's a 
court martial to be had, I'll have it. He knew he was a young man on the rise. Patty O'Rourke came over from Ireland to this country when he was one years of age in the 1840s, part of that whole Irish uh, immigration. He settled in Rochester, received at age 16 a scholarship to go to the University of Rochester. That was the plan. His father unexpectedly died. He had to go work in a stone quarry. He was a cutter. Found his way to West Point, graduated first in his class in 1861, the last graduating class before the war. Who was last in that class? General Custer. Now keep in mind, when you finish last, it doesn't mean you weren't a good student. It just means that he didn't respect the rules. You know, coming in, uh, he broke curfew a lot of times, wouldn't polish his boots and various other things. Some people are good in the classroom and not good in the field and vice versa. This man, Patty O'Rourke, was good in the classroom and in the field, and his star was on the rise. Everybody seemed to agree. Well, as he came pouring over the hillside, and this is a very knowledgeable man, too. Did you know he was attached to the Corps of Engineers the first year of the war, helped build defenses in Washington, D.C.? So this is not just any person. He understood the hiding and the lurking places on that hill. As he led the 140th, they were out of order. There was a narrow loggers trail on the northeast slope that the 140th had to take. And it put the men out of order, but there was no time to be lost. So Patty O'Rourke did what? He grabbed the regimental flag and stood on one of those rocks and waved it. Now when you wave a flag on top of a little round top during the second or third day of the battle, it's like waving a red flag in front of a bull. Because some of these best Texas marksmen were down in this marshy ground behind you, behind rocks. Their bodies were found afterwards. Photographs were taken. No doubt some of the photographs were, uh, men were moved around to make the, it more aesthetically pleasing. But there were dead Confederates found down there where Union soldiers would, would uh, hold up a hat on, um, uh, yeah, and, and, and wave it around on some kind of extension. That would get the Confederates to fire at the hat. And then another man would notice where the smoke came from and continue to direct fire on that rock, that lurking place, that hiding place. And so there were dead Confederates found there, but the Confederates did their damage too. One of the men killed up on the hill that day was Patty O'Rourke, maybe very well hit by a sharpshooter, if not one of these Texas marksmen. Another man tragically killed that day on the hill was, and there's some debate exactly to where he was hit, was Strong Vincent. He died without not having known that child. But he died up there on top of the hill, too. Lieutenant Porter Farley of the 140th New York from Rochester found Patty O'Rourke's lifeless body up on the rock where he had waved the flag, and he stared into his face, not unlike Captain Wagan had stared into the face of Augustus Van Horn Ellis of the 124th New York Orange Blossoms. It wasn't much time for reflection. They had to keep moving. But he paused long enough to reflect on how Clara would receive the news in Rochester. His beloved Clara would hear the news. She was devastated, but there was this large ecumenical service of Protestant and Catholic in the cities of Rochester. There was a parade through the streets, a respectful promenade. And his wife then would join the Society of Sacred Hearts. She was an educator for the convent there. Uh, so Clara would receive that news several days later. For Strong Vincent, who would be mortally wounded, he would languish in his wounds, slip in and out of conscience, wondering, wondering if he had, had, uh, would be remembered. Wondering, perhaps, about his legacy. Knowing that he would never see his child, he wouldn't see his wife, Elizabeth Carter, again. I'm happy to say that his men wouldn't forget him. And we'll probably mention that story before we're done. The 5th Texas were the shock troops, but the 4th Texas here under Colonel John Key came up the, the uh, western slope and found their way to near the top too to threaten the New Yorkers and to threaten the Michiganders. And there was fighting back and forth. The tipping point, though, was when the 140th New York poured over into this ground below. I'll say something quickly about the 4th Texas, part of the Texas Brigade. The 4th Texas 
under Colonel John Key, a good portion of them were from Washington County, Texas, where the declaration, their Declaration of Independence had been signed from Mexico in 1836. So they, their identity was tied to the notion they were independence fighters. The 4th and 5th Texas was stopped by the 140th, but not without casualties. As we get ready to leave this area, picture on the side of this slope, 24 of the 4th Texas dead, 25 of the 5th Texas dead, and both regiments, more than 70 wounded, lying on the side of the hill. The 140th New York had 32 dead on the side of these slopes, so gray and blue were intermingled together. Um, and as a transition, we'll end with a couple of soldier reminiscences. R Colonel Robert M. Powell of the 5th Texas, who commanded that regiment, wrote, the scene was strikingly like a devil's carnival. Carnival. Another yell and desperate charge followed, succeeded by a sudden and awful hush, just as if everyone had been stricken instantly with death. I could see my men lying around in every direction and in all attitudes. Uh, by the way, it was very loud through here. This uh, ground here resonates. The acoustics are incredible. Uh, allow me for a second to yell and you'll hear the echo. Hey! And in some other places it carries in a canyon-like echo effect. And so with all of the explosions, wonder how that went over on camera. Uh, <laughs> the the uh, noises caused in some parts of the fighting over here, nosebleeds and ear bleeds. So the concussions would have been awful. An another account of uh, a person that was actually in the fight here with the Texans. This is a soldier in the 5th Texas. His name is Private John Stevens. Comments, somehow I never thought of being hit by the enemy in front. Yet they were not 25 or 30 paces from us, and the balls flying as thick as hell. It had never occurred to me that there was any danger of being captured or that we could not whip the fight. Just then a slap on my back with a sword and an order to throw down my gun and behave myself came like a sudden clap of thunder. We have two more stops to make. Let's go head on up the hill. Don't get your water.